Bokatov, good morning. We are going to uh, start um, our first session about language and linguistic aspects um, of textuality with Aaron Koller, a professor of New Eastern Studies at Yeshiva University in New York, uh, where he practices um, studies of uh, textualization and other stuff, related stuff um, uh, in Semitic languages. Um, he's going to talk to us today um, about um, textualization and oralization in early Near Eastern writing. Please take note in writing. Okay, Aaron, please. Good morning. Thank you, Professor Rosen. It's a great pleasure to be here in person, and I want to first thank Rachel, Dana, and Margalit for first accepting this paper and for their many emails and many other hours of work to make sure that it was in fact possible to be here in this conference physically in Jerusalem today. I assume that the paper is leading off the regular proceedings of this conference because the topic, the textualization of language and the interplay of text and orality at the very beginning of writing, 5,000 years ago, is chronologically at the very beginning of the topic of orality and literacy. But I hope that it may be seen that the questions raised at the beginning of writing are also useful conceptually for framing the interactions of orality and textuality. The texts that I want to speak about this morning are mundane, everyday writing. Human beings have been speaking for 200,000 years, <clears throat> creating art for 80,000 years, but writing for just over 5,000 years. The origins of writing are still a mystery that has not yet been conclusively solved, but it's clear that writing was originally developed for bureaucratic purposes, not what we may, might call literary purposes. Writing allowed people to keep track for the first time of how many sheep they had sent out to pasture with the shepherd and how much grain each person owed in taxes. And while the history of writing is a well-trod field, as Peter Daniels has recently observed, the question of how writing systems represent language is far less studied. Writing was not invented to record spoken language. Instead, it was invented to do the jobs that spoken language does not do well. <clears throat> Therefore, early writing didn't mirror real language. It contained the bare minimum needed to convey information. The first writing that we might call writing appears among the Sumerians in Uruk in around 3,300 BCE, but no Sumerian grammatical particles appear until 2,800 BCE, more than four centuries later, and there's no word order in writing until 2,400 BCE, nearly a millennium after its invention. Early writing is more similar to signs like a peace sign or a traffic sign. They convey meaning as an idea, but are, these are typically not considered real writing because they can't be read out loud with any certainty as to how they're supposed to sound. So is this a, this blue one over here, is this a, a roundabout or a rond-point or a kikar tnua? Everyone will read it in whatever language they feel comfortable. The same is true with numerals. The same signs could be read as Swasandi or Sevendi or Shivim, depending on what language you happen to be speaking and therefore what happened you, language you happen to be expecting to read. But there are obviously drawbacks to a system of this sort. Clearly, one cannot write a novel or a poem, but in most ancient times, this had not even occurred to anyone. More significant is that I cannot write the shepherd's name who has my sheep or the name of the person who's supposed to pay those taxes. Some non-literate cultures do have ways of 
encoding identity. Consider the interesting case of the letter from Turtle following his wife, a member of the Cheyenne tribe in the late 19th century, to his son, Little Man, asking that he send a sum of dollars, which are represented by a number of circles in between the two. The meaning of this communication was clear. It was actually sent from one post office to another, where the son picked it up. But most would contend that this is still not writing, because it cannot be read aloud. It's good fortune that the two names involved are semantically transparent. So this is Turtle following his wife, and he's labeled by drawing a turtle following his wife. This is Little Man, and he's labeled by drawing a little man above his head. But this can't work with most other names. The point can be made, the point can be made by thinking about a more recent example, a book by a Chinese conceptual artist, Xu Bing, and his book, Book from the Ground. You see that? That's the cover of the book on the right. The book is written entirely in pictograms. And the book tells a story of a day in the life of one man. According to the artist, to Xu Bing, this is a book that anyone can read since it's independent of language. That may or may not be true. What's more important for our purposes here is that it's not a good book. There is much that cannot be said without real words. The protagonist, for example, has no name. How could he? The author's name also never appears in the book, nor does the title. You have to find these things out only from the metadata online. It's a very interesting experience. <laughs> so, so, we will look quickly at two developments in the early history of writing that bring text and language, oral language, closer together. While earliest writing reflects exclusively the semantic level of language, the meaning, and reflects no phonetic information at all, this was very limiting regarding what could be written. So both Mesopotamian and Egyptian scribes subsequently developed methods of writing, of writing anything they could say. In both cases, the capacity to write phonetically began with personal names and developed from there. The most basic tactic was the rebus principle, where a common noun stood in for the sound of its name rather than for the object itself. One of the first clear examples is the well-known Narmer palette from roughly 3100 BCE. The king's name, Narmer, is represented by two hieroglyphs, which you can see a number of times here in the pictures. In the bottom right, for example, a catfish, Na'ar, and a chisel, Mer. It's important to emphasize that this is not the same tactic as the one we saw in the Cheyenne letter of Turtle following his wife because that label was based entirely on the meaning of the person's name, not the sounds. In fact, the, the man's name was not Turtle following his wife, because Turtle following his wife is, of course, English. I don't know Cheyenne, but I can understand the label in that earlier text anyway, because it can be translated, as the pictures convey the meaning rather than the sounds. That is not true for the Egyptian system. Catfish chisel is not the name of the king. The visual pun only works in Egyptian, where those two words, na'ar mer, yield the king's name when combined. So we can summarize this as, as follows. True writing <clears throat> operates in part on the phonetic level of language, whereas other systems of conveying meaning, numerals, traffic signs, cuneiform, earliest, earliest cuneiform, and Cheyenne letters operate entirely on the semantic level. This second stage of writing, then, is when we can speak seriously of the textualization of language for the first time. This was a major leap forward, because for, for the first time now, scribes could record anyone's name and many other words that were otherwise too abstract to have been written earlier, prepositions, adjectives, many verbs, even abstract nouns. It was still centuries until literature came to be written down, however. As the anthropologist C.C. Lambert Karlovsky put it, there is a difference between being literate and being literary. And it took the passing of almost a millennium 
for the literate to become literary. But importantly, cuneiform and Egyptian scripts never moved fully to a phonetic level and away from the semantic level. I'm going to skip this, I think, for the purposes of time, however. The earliest text that we have that reflect <clears throat> on the invention of writing is a Sumerian myth called Enmerkar and the Lord of Arata from the 21st century BCE. In the story, Enmerkar is the king of Uruk, who has been repeatedly sending a messenger to the king of Arata. Eventually, the messenger cannot recall all that he is charged to convey. And the text says, his speech was substantial, its contents extensive. The messenger, whose mouth was heavy, was not able to repeat it. Because the messenger, whose mouth was tired, was not able to repeat it, the lord of Kulaba, that's Enmerkar, padded some clay and wrote the message as if on a tablet. Formerly, the writing of messages on clay was not established. Now, under that sun and on that day, it was indeed so. Now, the story gets one very big thing right. Writing was most li likely invented in Uruk around 3300 BCE, but it gets one very big thing wrong. It thinks of writing as a way of encoding spoken language. By the time of Enmerkar, features had been added into writing that, in fact, had brought script closer and closer to spoken language. A little later, a Sumerian proverb from old Babylonian time says, a scribe whose hand matched the mouth, he is indeed a scribe. Now, while Enmerkar is wrong on the, his on the early history of writing, it is the ideal of the scribe whose hand matched the mouth that sets the stage conceptually for the next development, which is the early alphabet. The alphabet was invented only once, probably in the area of the Sinai around 4,000 years ago. What makes the alphabet conceptually distinctive, certainly in its pure early form, is that it is entirely focused on the phonetic level and not the semantic level of language at all. The early alphabetic inscriptions pay no attention to meaning, simply transcribe consonantal sound after consonantal sound. These texts do not mark word boundaries. There is no such thing as proper spelling. It is the easiest system to write in a spelling bee in the Sinai in 1800 BCE, no one would ever get out because it's virtually impossible to get spelling wrong. One interesting example of the thorough phonetization of the writing here is numbers. Both cuneiform and Egyptian writing have separate signs for numbers, what we would call numerals. They don't spell out the names of the numbers, but Alphabetic scripts tend to actually write out the names of the numbers. So in the Hebrew Bible, for example, one never finds a numeral. One never finds a 1-7 for Shiva Asar. One finds the sounds of the number, Shiva Asar, spelled out as if it were a regular word. That's a, a thorough phoneticization of language that's not found in other writing systems. There are interesting examples of that, that uh, in the epigraphic record that I, I won't pursue here. This writing system was directly tied to the spoken language, contained none of the lexical and morphemic information that cuneiform or hieroglyphs have. But the simplicity, sorry, simplicity of the system is also its weakness. It provides essentially no help for readers trying to decode these texts. As it turns out, the reading process tends to go word by word, not grapheme by grapheme. In regular, rapid reading, our brains process each word in turn, getting cues in advance from the spaces before and after each word as to how long the word will be. In Egyptian writing, there are certain signs called determinatives or classifiers, which always mark the ends of words, and those can cue the brain to know when a word's going to end. In Japanese writing, where there are no spaces, the transition from a simple, curvy hiragana character to a more complex kanji character, you see examples on the slide, it turns out to be a sufficient visual clue to the presence of a word boundary that can cue readers' brains as to where a word will break. In early alphabetic text, the brain gets no help from spacing or any other sign as to where a word ends. There are other drawbacks to the radical simplicity of the early alphabet, most importantly, the lack of vowels. Anyone who's tried to learn to read unpointed Arabic or Hebrew without the elaborate system of vowel letters that modern Hebrew has 
uh, knows just what an obstacle this is to fluid reading. A sequence of three letters could be any one of a number of words. Gadol, Gdola, Gidal, Gadal, Giddala, Gadala, Giddalu, all of which are related but very importantly different words would all be spelled with the same three letters in a system like the early alphabet. So the only way to read then would be to proceed sign by sign and sound it out, correcting yourself as you go. And the lack of spacing may have suggested that as well because Paul Sanger argued a number of decades ago that the lack of spacing in classical text was correlated with the practice of reading out loud. Unfortunately, I don't have time this morning for thinking about early Greek writing, but the idea that was alluded to uh, yesterday evening um, that's been defended a number of times, more recently by Barry Powell, that the early Greek writing was invented for uh, writing hexametric poetry is very intriguing in, in, uh, in, this, in this context. But for the early alphabetic text, there's another alternative. Not only reading out loud, many of these texts were, may never have been meant to be read at all. The point was the writing. The texts are almost all dedicatory and Thanksgiving inscriptions, so needed to be read only by gods and goddesses, who presumably can read even without spaces. All of this explains why the alphabet did not quickly spread after its invention. Egyptians continued to write in hieroglyphs and hieratic. Mesopotamians, Anatolians, Canaanites, and others continued to write in cuneiform. It took most of a millennium for the alphabet to begin to be used for extended texts, what we might call something like literary texts. The introduction of word dividers was a major step in the direction of making the alphabet usable. But there's another dramatic development that we see in the scripts of the Iron Age, and that's non-phonemic or non-phonetic spelling practices, where the spelling reflects either an older pronunciation, what we call historical spelling, or the root of the word, what we call etymological spelling. For an example, think about Hebrew three words, rosh, rishon, and reshit, all of which contain a silent aleph, never pronounced, which, in a sense, the aleph represents three different vowels in these three different words, o, e, and a. No doubt, ancient Israelite kids complained about these spellings in the same way that modern English-speaking kids complain about silent k's in words like knife. But the Aleph is very useful for showing that these three words are semantically related. And that's the great advantage of not purely, semantic, uh, not purely phonetic spelling. Semantic information can be conveyed by the spelling. So you can think also about English electric, electricity, and electrician, where the C is pronounced in three different ways, k, s, and sh. And although that's annoying for people who think about English spelling, there is obvious great benefit to seeing the word electric within the two other words. The plural morpheme is another example, but I'll, uh, I won't worry about the details now. Uh, sorry. The other, <clears throat> sorry. The other major reason for preserving non-phonemic spellings is to not only visually contain, convey semantic connections, like in these examples, but to convey semantic distinctions. So in speaking, if I say out loud the sentence, the boy was scared of the night, that's an ambiguous sentence. But when I'm forced to choose between spelling the last word as N-I-G-H-T or K-N-I-G-H-T, the written form disambiguates. The key point is that a writing system that is purely phonetic is incredibly easy to learn to write, but incredibly difficult to read. And in fact, rapid reading relies on there being an interplay between the oral components of language and the text that is in front of the reader. There's always an interplay between the written le letters on the page or the stone or the clay and the oral language that the reader already knows. Some of the wrong turns in the early history of writing show us that when the interplay is not well balanced, when writing is too much dependent on oral language or too much dependent on the written language, writing and especially reading cannot be effective. So by conclusion, many early writing systems are in qualitative flux for a number of centuries before settling into a status quo. And while of course there are many factors that govern writing systems, including political power, cultural norms, material limitations, and others, one of the reasons for that flux is often an evolution 
towards a more efficient writing system. This, of course, begs the question of efficient for what? And we've already seen that the easiest conceivable writing system for writing is quite difficult, or maybe quite difficult, for reading. Similarly, what a king wants for his royal inscriptions may not be what a scribe wants for administrative records. And of course, in many cases, multiple script traditions develop for just these reasons. The early alphabet landed in a place that attempts to strike a balance between the written and the oral, between the purely textual and the language-based. When we in English or French especially complain about the depth of our orthographies, the gap between the way the words look and the way we know that they are supposed to sound, we are putting our fingers on the way that all writing mediates between the textual and the oral. Thank you. Let me ask you, if I may intervene, where, where do you place, let's say, syllabic uh, alphabets? You, I think you didn't touch upon, upon those. Well, or partially, partially syllabic, like, something like uh, linear B or even logarithmic. It's more, more new line. Uh, so, uh, what would you say about those? Yeah. And, uh, what is the principle behind those? Yeah, thank you. It, they're, they're, first of all, historically, it's very interesting because it seems like in the early part, let's say the first third of the second millennium BCE, there are a number of attempts at making writing more phonetic. So we have, uh, well, linear A... <coughs> Maybe, uh, certainly a linear B. We have the syllabary from Byblos that has yeah. not been deciphered. The or right, or right, whatever. exactly. Uh, and, and absolutely right. So the, the pure syllabaries, the, the Cypriot syllabary, for example, yeah. is really phonetic. It's, it's fully phonetic, but it's still. Rel oh. I like talking to Professor Rosen. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no, no, no. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, it's purely phonetic. <laughs> But it still relies on the reader knowing the language. Because, of course, the syllabaries assume that you know which vowels to pronounce and which vowels not to pronounce. In, the, in those syllabaries, it, to, to record the, the consonant clusters, for example, of these Aegean languages, uh, a syllabary has no, no way of, of recording a, a consonant cluster. So the Cypriot syllabary, for example, will simply write the, the same I'm sorry, the same vowel in two, con two consecutive signs and rely on the reader to know not to pronounce the first one. So um, if you wanted to write kti, for example, you would write ki t and rely on the reader not to pronounce that first iota. Um, so there is a, you're absolutely right, Professor Rosen, this is a, a move very comparable to the alphabet in trying to come up with a system that is thoroughly phonetic. It records only the phonetic values. There's nothing there that records uh, determinatives. It doesn't convey any semantic information. The Cypriot syllabary does have something like word dividers. If you think about that series of, of uh, signs that end with e eh, that show up only at the end of words, so that's something that could cue the brain that this is the end of a word. So it's a little bit more helpful for the reader than the, than the alphabet. But it's conceptually very similar to the alphabet in moving towards pure phonetics without any of the semantic or morphemic information. And yet, it relies for that reason very heavily on the reader actually knowing the language and therefore being able to translate the signs into a real word. And that's what I think is, is so fascinating in, in these, in these uh, phonetic systems, except for, except for Greek itself, except for the you know, 8th century Greek. All of these systems, uh, syllabaries and the alphabet in the, in the Semitic world, uh, are, never provide enough phonetic information for a reader to read if they don't already know the language. There's simply no way to decode these things without knowing how to pronounce the letter. You have to know already the vowels uh, if you, if you want to read. So yeah, I, absolutely. They, they, that's, that's very, very uh, centrally belongs in the story. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody? Um, oh, yes, Mishup. Oh, there's some first. Oh, yeah. Please. Please. Deborah. 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 Debor
So I'm wondering about Chinese characters, where my understanding is that Chinese television uses subtitles because the people speaking Mandarin and the people speaking Cantonese use the same ideograms but pronounce them completely differently. And so they use subtitles to make sure everybody can watch the same television program. How does that fit into this system where you're really sort of strongly detaching the sound from the semantics? Right. Yeah, thank you. And I, I should say first that my understanding of Chinese is all, all secondhand. So if there's anyone here who wants to fill this in or correct me, please, please do. Um, but yeah, that's, that, that's exactly right. So the, uh, there is the official orthography of Chinese that masks the fact that we have not just different pronunciations, that, that sounds like there's different accents. Uh, there's entirely different words that are being written with the same sign uh, with the same meaning, but are actually different words on the, on the level of spoken language. Um, so that's really, it, it's actually really fascinating because it's almost the opposite of what we find in some of these early systems where, um, uh, well, the early alphabetic systems, I'm sorry, where they're really trying to map sound to sign in a one-to-one -one, uh, one -one level. On the other hand, some of the, the systems like cuneiform or hieroglyphs, and even more so, uh, early cuneiform, which doesn't encode sound at all, there is a there there is a serious. I, I think there's an answer to the debate, but there's a serious debate uh, as to whether we can prove that the first cuneiform writing was in fact by Sumerian speakers, because there's so little phonetic information there that it's actually very hard to tell what language underlies these signs. If you draw a donkey and then eight little dots next to it, it's clear that you mean eight donkeys, but it's not at all clear what language you speak. So in a sense, the Chinese uh, has ancient antecedents. And of course, Chinese, uh, the writing system is not quite as old as, as what I'm talking about, but not, not so much younger. Um, what's really fascinating, again, from what I've read in uh, Chinese today, is that uh, the, the uh, standard way now of typing in Chinese is a system called pinyin, where you type on the same keyboard that I have in front of me. So if I want to type xiang, I'll type X, I, and then the computer will give me a number of choices. And I'll pick the sign that I want, but I've never input a Chinese system, right? Because uh, it's a technical problem to figure out how to fit, pick a number, but uh, you know, you probably need about four or 5,000 signs to function in a, a, a re relatively prosaic um, uh, context. So one of the reasons that the Chinese government likes pinyin is that you can't avoid standard Beijing Mandarin if you're going to use pinyin. You have to type XIA if you want to do Xiang. You can type in your own local dialect from the Northwest or whatever uh, and then get the same sign. So it's actually a sort of roundabout way that the government is softly but very effectively imposing Mandarin pronunciation on the rest of China, which is fascinating. Okay. Anybody here? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, I, uh, thank you very much for, for your talk. It was brilliant. And my question is, uh, what do you think about the view that the um, so-called Phoenician alphabet, since it has no vowels, is actually just another uh, syllabarium? Yeah. Um, there is such a view, you know. There, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so this is famously Gelb's view. Um, Gelb's argument was, was essentially a, a typological argument. Uh, he argued that, um, that never in the history of writing do we go from uh, semantic-based writing, like hieroglyphs and cuneiform, directly to... Uh, a pure alphabet. It always has to go through a syllabary stage. Uh, so I'll say that methodologically, I'm not all that convinced by that. He's right, factually, there's no other examples, but the alphabet was invented once in the world. So there's never any example ever of anything going to the alphabet. So the typological argument makes me a little bit wary. And he's, he's, uh, he's, he's arguing that we know exactly how writing systems progress, and this is what we expect in the next stage. At one level, it's almost um, a vacuous question, uh, meaning 
in the, on the level of, of reading and the level of writing, it's very hard to see what the implications of this would be. Uh, so if I went back to my slide, which I don't know if I can pull up again, uh, if I write Gimel Dalit Lamid, and I would say, I, I think it's an alphabet. So I say, there's, there are no vowels here. There are only three consonants. And Gelb would say, it's a syllabary. There are unstated vowels or an, a zero vowel after each of those consonants. So it's hard to tell what the difference is on the practical level. Gelb was more interested in the theoretical claim that this is a syllabary with unstated vowels so that he could preserve the typological um, sequence that he, that he developed. So I know, uh, I think Powell in that, in that book also defends it. I, I don't recall if that was important for him or if it was just something that he was also interested in. Um, but I, I am both skeptical of it because the argument is, is theoretical rather than, I don't see any empirical evidence for it. And I'm not sure what's at stake here. I've never quite understood if it matters on the practical level um, for, for reading or writing. Thank you. There are, I mean, there are, sorry. The Ethiopic system is, is a system that developed from the alphabet that does, that is a syllabary, that the, the, uh, the unmodified consonants are the consonant plus the a vowel, and then you can modify them with little, uh, little schmitchicks at the, <laughs> at the top to make it an E or an A or an O vowel. So it's conceivable that that could be grafted onto the alphabet, but in the early alphabet, there's just, I see no, no evidence for it. And as we mentioned, there are syllabaries floating around. They knew how to make syllabaries if they wanted. So I, I don't see any evidence for it. And again, I'm not sure what's at stake. Thank you. Our last question, yes, please. I'm wondering if you have a comment uh, jumping way ahead to the modern period and uh, what is called stream of consciousness writing it's not terribly, say, such as James Joyce. Uh, it's not terribly literate, it's literary, uh, and it's orality because it could be a performance. Right. Um, did we advance? Uh, was that an experiment? Can we expect more of that in the future? Uh, right, well, I'll, I'll, I, I don't have any comments on James Joyce uh, other than, you know, it's very hard. <laughs> but um, but the, I think your, your important point that you're making is that writing and oral language are never the same thing, right? So I've been talking in the ancient times about how they were at first very, very far apart and came closer together. But actually one of the, I, I started taking screenshots now that we've spent the last year and a half on Zoom. You know, Zoom has a, a transcription um, feature, right? We can get the, the transcript of what's being said. It's automatic. So you can listen and read at the same time if you want. And if you look at the transcription, there, there are obviously funny examples where they're transcribing the wrong thing. That's funny. But even when they're transcribing the right thing, it's a great way of seeing what happens when you take actual oral language and put it in writing. None of us would write that way. We would all clean it up. We wouldn't repeat ourselves so often. It's redundant. Things that come up with, you know, listen to me right now. Uh, obviously, if I, if I wrote this, it would be a very different genre. So you know, what Joyce is doing and what other uh, modernist writers try to do is say, like, well, what would it look like if I actually wrote the way I speak? And the reason that's an interesting question is because we never write the way we speak. There's always a gap between written language and oral language. That's not quite the conceptual gap that I've been talking about on the level of sounds and decoding, but it is absolutely true that we all are multilingual in that way and, and actually know how to express ourselves in different ways depending on the medium. Let us thank again. Uh,